Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to the Marriage is Tougher Than Woodpecker Lips podcast. This is Brian. And I'm Paul. We'd like to welcome you to a community meant for the men of the world to share our thoughts and perspectives on marriage. We can learn from each other's experiences and help each other be better husbands. Now, let's get right into the show. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode. We are going to talk about finances in marriage. Um, we have my friend John Sullivan with us. Brian and I are just going to hear about his journey and ask some questions. Hopefully it can be beneficial to you. We'd also like to invite you to connect with us on our socials, Searching Marriage is Tougher. You can connect with us on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and our website, marriageistougher.com. If you'd like to be a guest, you can connect with us there. Fill out a short um, form. It doesn't cost you anything to be a guest, but we will qualify you, and then we'll move forward from there. If you have any topic ideas or just want to continue the conversation with us, you can do it in those places. All right. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate you coming on. So we're going to ask you a couple questions and just get right into it. So Let's first it. off, who is John? Uh, who is John? I am John Sullivan. I am, well, I guess I can start by qualifying uh, things that I do. I write code. I'm a software developer. Uh, play guitar do some photography, travel a bit, and married to a wonderful, wonderful woman named Kalika, my wife, and pretty involved at my church, really involved in faith. Um, do a lot of random things on the side as far as uh, recently got a house, doing a lot of DIY projects, learning how all that works. I've been into cars in the last couple of years, so learning how all those components work. And I guess I'm best quantified as a nerd slash engineer slash good friend. Nice. And how long have you been married to your wife? We just passed two years a couple months ago. We got married in October of 2020. We were one of the mid-COVID uh, weddings ceremonies, so... We kind of got to enjoy that and that that plays a little bit into the financial outlooks that we'll talk about later but covid was a lot of things but it was sort of a low-key mechanism for saving a lot of money and getting married to the uh the guys of the only family covid uh ceremony kind of thing actually played to a lot of people's favor in not spending twenty thousand dollars on a wedding so but yeah, to answer your question, we've been married in a little over two years now. Uh, how long were you guys engaged before you got married? We got engaged in June of 2020 and got married in October. So pretty quick. We got engaged and we were planning on having a little bit longer of an engagement and going out until May of the next year, um, which would be a little bit under a year. And I think as we got into the initial phases of planning and realized how big that would have been, we were looking at a 100, 150 person guest list, which you got to remember at that time, we thought COVID was going to be over by then. Um, and that just, you know, is what it is. But we basically decided that was a lot stressful and didn't represent the the nature we wanted of our wedding and ceremony to be a lot more family-based and faith-based. And so we basically just scrapped the whole plan. And I think this was in September. We said, let's just do this in six weeks. And so we ended up getting married in October uh, with just family around and a really small thing. And it was awesome. Wow. Uh, what, well, I know it's only been a couple of years, but so far, what do you think the best thing about being married is? I feel like it's hard to describe or quantify, but just the, the general partnership that comes with having someone by your side all the time. You don't ever have to, you always have someone to share news with. You always have something, someone to talk things over with. You always have someone to spend the day with. You're never alone physically. And I think that that partnership is super comforting and it, you know it can come with challenges too 
I think that a lot of people experience those as well. But for me, it, it's the companionship is maybe the word that that is lovely. Valid answer. Uh, <laughs> what is your favorite characteristic of your wife? Kalika has the biggest heart of anyone I know. She loves people really, really well and really, really big. And that's something I, I strive for in a lot of ways. I, I strive and try to be more compassionate and thoughtful and uh, think of people randomly. But Kalika really does that so well, just automatically. She has the biggest heart for people. And that is, it's just, it's, it's awesome. It's big and it's warm and she loves people really well. What is a challenge or what has challenged you in being married? I think for me, one thing that's challenged me and I'm still growing through is when you have that companionship and you're, you're with each other all the time, sometimes it's hard to work past the, the argument moment that can happen. And specifically for myself, like if we are in some kind of disagreement and I feel frustration building up inside of me for one reason or another, I think we've all been there, but moving on from that, I found to be challenging. It's, it's hard to release that frustration and move on, especially if you're continuing to be in the same physical space for uh, a good period of time after that. And I like to, for me, it's like you're driving in the car. And something happens and you, you get riled up and frustrated and you're like, well, we're still driving in the car for another three hours. We can't go anywhere. How do I just move on from this moment? How do I just release that frustration? That's really hard. <laughs> so I'm still working on it, but that's a challenge I continue to try to grow through and to, to find the, I don't know if it's grace or patience or to find the reset button and be able to move forward from whatever that was back into something that's normal, not even loving, just like normal before you get to loving is challenging and necessary because if you don't, you, you've now potentially ruined the rest of your time for quite a while and potentially ruined some some moments that you could have otherwise gotten through and um, so that's been on my heart but that's a challenge that's hard stuff Hashtag Man, you, yeah you you jumped right into uh the marriage conundrum right off the, <laughs> off the bat I'm being honest out here yeah that's that's good um what was your example of marriage or what is your examples of marriage yeah, my example has always been my parents. Uh, they've been or married. Be more than one, too, but example is sure. tomorrow, I guess. I think my parents have been my most impactful example. Uh, I don't know exactly what year they got married. I feel like I probably should, but they've been married longer than I've ever been alive. And they've had their challenges, and I've, I've seen that. I think I think all marriages do, but they've been willing to push through it for the sake of the marriage. And I, I, you know, as everyone who gets married finds, like you, you inherit a lot of roles that you've watched growing up through your parents. And I'm, I, my parents aren't perfect, but they set a really good example and I'm really proud of their marriage and their love. And I, I think that that, it just shaped me in so many ways. I'm really grateful for them, but they're, they're a solid, they're solid parents. They're a solid marriage. They're wonderful, really wonderful people. And I continue to treasure them as role models and examples in marriage and life, uh, even though I don't live near them anymore, but I love visiting and I, I still try to get a lot of time with them. And we're very fortunate to be able to go visit them fairly often and they have a great relationship with Kalika and yeah, we have a really, really awesome set of parents and my parents, her parents are also 
wonderful. Um, I don't want to leave them out, but for me, that was probably my biggest role model growing up. Awesome. And what would you say is the secret sauce? This I'm learning this answer might change over the years, but what's it, what is it so far for you? The secret sauce to marriage in general? Yeah. Well, for your, your marriage in particular, or if you've seen it in multiple scenarios uh, overall. Yeah, the, as far as I've known it, it's only been a couple of years. I'm not, I'm not 40 years in, right? But it's just more patience and more grace. And I know some people that are 40 years in that would probably say the same thing, but it's one thing to say it out loud. And it's another thing to have to live in that moment and choose to give more patience and grace. And I need it just as much as anyone else. I'm a pain in the butt plenty of the time too. But making the decision in a in a moment that's already hard that you're going to give more patience and grace is the growth moment and i think it's that's the moment of the secret sauce there's no there's no turnkey answer it's choosing to make a difficult choice at a time that's already hard that is the secret sauce to me that's good that's a new one <laughs> yeah i can't argue with that one all right I like it. All right. So um, we're going to talk about why you're here. So let's do it. Oh, I love this topic. Yeah. Finances. Um, I know Brian and I were like, man, we should do a series on it because we, we have so many thoughts and things on it. Um, yeah. So we may revisit this in like a couple week, like a series of a couple back to back episodes, but um, you know, I was just telling Brian a little bit about your journey from um when I met you all the way back, and I won't tell your story, I'll let you tell it, but um, just I was telling him that you know you're now living next to us in the housing market and yeah. a little bit about your journey from where you've been living while you were married and how that all came to be. So, um, if you can just give us a, a just your why why do you like finances so much or mm. why is it important to you and then um maybe your journey kind of from that airport moment to you know buying a house yeah yeah i do love personal finances i'm deeply passionate about it it's something that i even want to expand more into as far as i don't know if that means coaching or or talking about it more i don't know i'm very passionate about it without an outlet yet um but it's i do love it i i yearn for my friends and family and everyone around me to grow in that area and that's a little difficult because you can't really inject yourself into people's lives like that but i yearn for it and i i pray over that a lot but yes love the topic love talking about it it's a big world there's a lot of a lot of factors to personal finances. And I wonder if one of the reasons in me that I'm so passionate about it is that I feel like it's not actually that devious when you get into it. It's not actually that complicated. It's very approachable. There's just a lot of big words that people use to make it feel not approachable. Because when you keep someone at arm's length and you make them feel like they can't approach this thing, now they have to trust you for all the information on this thing. And now you've just described every credit card company. So when I first learned about personal finances, I feel like I unlocked the secret to success in life in a lot of ways, just by knowledge. And I still think that's true. You, you, there's so much available that you just need to learn a little bit and you can have a lot of success with it and, and truly feel like you've, you've opened a door, you've unlocked the code, right? For me, it started at an airport, as Paul mentioned. I was in college. Uh, I was a software development intern. Uh, so I studied computer science in college and I, my career is in software development. I was at a layover in Denver. I met a guy. He told me that he had just paid off his house. And you gotta understand the context is I grew up in California and was 100% Bay Area and went to school in Ohio where I now live. but. When someone told me that they paid off their house 
as a sophomore in college that really didn't understand finances at all yet. All I knew was houses were a million dollars and you'd never pay them off because I grew up in California and that's how California works. So I was immediately just mind blown. What are you talking about? You pay off a house. That's not a thing. And he told me, we talked for probably an hour there at the airport, just about some basic stuff about how excited he was. And that was the first time it dawned on me that you could have a paid off house. I didn't even ever think about the concept that someone could own a house and they don't owe anyone money for it. And they have the deed to the land. And if anything were to ever happen, they own the house. You're good to go. And that was pretty pivotal for me as a turn point to, I want to, I want to do that. That sounds pretty cool. I'd like to do that. I think that sounds secure and neat and you have a family and you want to be, you know, the security of owning a home properly, fully paid off owning a home when you have a family and, and a legacy you want to leave is can't be overstated. And I think that's something that was happening more in prior, I should say centuries, much less generations. But that kicked off my learning point. He introduced me to a couple different books. I read a ton in college. I immediately became crazy saver mode for the next couple of years in school. Um, it was a lot of fun. And then since then, I've just been not always super responsible. I've made choices I shouldn't have and have been down the a couple rabbit holes that I really don't recommend for people. But through that, I've learned a lot and have been tremendously blessed in our circumstances. And I'm sure we'll get into that. But that that's a much bigger answer than you're probably wanting to. Where'd you start? Uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Brian. Um, so I was just wanting to make a comment. Um, I, I've thought about this for a while, how often people talk about owning a home, mm -hmm. how few actually do, mm -hmm. right? Because it's held by the bank. Yeah. And we, we do the same with cars. And in my mind, it's, well, no, you, you kind of just committed to paying for it. Yeah, it's real. You know? Yeah. And, and, and we, we so often put ourselves in situations where we can't actually afford to pay for it. Or the, the purchase we committed to make leads to other expenses that we mm -hmm. didn't necessarily calculate. And then, mm -hmm. you know, now yeah. we're in a situation. So I, I don't know why I've thought yeah. that so long, but I have for some Yo, reason. Yo, that's fantastic. Yeah, you don't really own it. You just committed to paying for it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'll be transparent. I, I love this topic and to love this topic and talk about it, you have to be transparent with your own, you know, a lot of your own stuff because that's how you relate with people. We just bought a house, as Paul alluded to, our first house uh, a few weeks ago. And I totally agree with you because there have been a lot of people that have told us, hey, congratulations on buying your first house. You're a new homeowner. How does it feel? And yes, the, the deed is in our name, I guess. And as you break down the legalities of it, do you own the house? Well, technically, sure. But there's a bank that has this house as, uh, what is it? A, uh, you know, they're on, the, they're on the deed as a secured interest, right? And I love the, the joy of we're new homeowners and that's awesome. And it is a cool thing. But at the same time, like, let me not just mention the giant bank on my back now that's like, this is a humongous loan that apparently people just live with for 30 years paying at the default rate. And that scares me. I don't want this thing on my, on my shoulders for that long, much less at the size that it is. We're talking about principal loans that are huge. I mean, it's one thing to come out of college with a couple or even tens of grand in, in student debt that a lot of people do these days, but Buying a house with a mortgage is a humongous number. If, uh, to me, I don't want that number on my shoulders. Uh, longer than I could possibly get it. I'm trying to get that thing gone. So I totally agree with you. Yeah. I like yeah, that. I think saying even saying that, right, would change the perspective of, oh, I, I think it might give urgency to people. If you say, hey, you're committed to paying on this house, they're like, oh, 
feel like I own it, but I don't. Right. So let me let me, you know, put some things in place to own this or that or the car, whatever car you get. Yeah, you can pay that off pretty quickly. Most of us don't. But if you really dig in, you can bang that out with a couple sacrifices and it is really yours. Then all you're yeah. paying for is maintenance, right? Maintenance and insurance, registration every year. But yeah, you know, I know, I know we're uh oh, sorry. I know no, we're no. uh probably making a bunch of listeners uncomfortable. So I apologize. I know it's a hard <laughs> topic. But I totally agree. It I'm really looking for as much as I'm I'm really enjoying this time of wow, you got a house, you're a new homeowner. That's exciting. I agree. I'm looking forward to when I own this house for real, when there's no more bank, when it's paid off, when I can say, this is our house, we own it. Nothing can happen to it. That's, you know, if I, something were to happen to both of us, we own this house, we can pass it on. It's, it's done. It's on the deed. There's no one else. This is a chunk of land that's in our name. That day is so much more exciting to me. Not that this hasn't been exciting. This has been tremendously exciting. We love this place already. But until it's really, really, really ours and no one can take it away, there's a different, that's a different thing. It's like when I paid off my car and, and my car was one of the unfortunate decisions that for one reason or another happened in college for me. And I got like a 13% loan rate on it. It was, it was tragic. Um, but when I paid it off, now I own that car. I really own that car. I owned it before, like kind of, depending on how you want to talk about titles, but now it's my car. And I'm going to drive that car until I can't anymore because I own it and I want to get all the value out of it that I can. It's just, it's different. That day of ownership, when there's no more loan involved, it hits different. You know, you, that is so true. I was just thinking about when we paid off one of our other cars and it was like, Oh, like when we changed insurance, because even something is like changing your insurance, like you have to put, you know, the bank on the insurance or prove to whoever has, uh, mm. you know, that loan. You have to send them that you have insurance and all that stuff when you switch it. Yeah. But like, that's not a thing. Like you, right. you just, oh, I'm going to get a better rate. I'm just going to change this. I don't have to fax anything, email anything, none of that. Like, yeah, yeah. I met Lee and Holder. I recently was able to take that off of my insurance. Um, and then I also recently changed vehicles. And to be able to do that again uh, is empowering. You know, but, and, and it's funny because I think differently about vehicles now. I used to want to buy them to impress people or to be able to say, oh, yeah, you know, I have this. But now it's, I, I do it more for myself. Mm. right and not so much to impress people paul knows that i just downgraded in year and upgraded in mileage for the vehicle that i want but still don't have a payment and actually put 4k in the bank because good for you i traded in something that was more valuable so that's awesome paid off but um going back a little bit to the house you had me thinking about something funny it kind of circulated in my mind from this guy who does uh, TikTok videos. And I don't know that explaining that is so important, but when people talk about what they paid for the house, I often want to like pop their or burst their bubble and say, yeah, but what about the, in the interest? Right. Yeah. So if you yeah. think I'm paying for it for that actual 30 years, like, did you just pay like double in interest? Yeah, I got a story for you. Go ahead. Uh, as we know, interest rates currently, November, December of 22, insanely high, insanely high. Um, well, okay, with a caveat, obviously nowhere near as high as it was for the majority of the life of the US. The majority of time in the US, interest rates were much higher than they even are now. But coming off of 2018, 2019, where we were at, you know, prime rates of 2%, 2.5%, and now being in the sevens, very high, feels very high. Anyway, that question is the single question that every marketing company wants you to not think about. So we just bought this house. Transparent, we have a 7.5% loan 
uh, of interest rate on loan, which is crazy high. And we'll refi as soon as rates come down. So I'm not too worried about it. But the other factor there is we'll be overpaying this thing as fast as possible. Like I said, I want this thing to be paid off as soon as possible. But if we didn't, if we didn't, we would be paying over the course of 30 years, like 250% of the house, which is crazy. And I know it's, it's common to ignore that and to not talk about it, but that's money you earned. Yeah, cool. It's over 30 years. I understand it may not be the same impact to your monthly budget, but that's still money you earned that you don't have anymore. And with houses, we're talking on the order of a million dollars, $500,000 in just interest cost that you earned, that you paid and will never see again. So I know it can be, you know, for us, it can be harder to make monthly overpayments and, and try to cut away that loan faster. But for us, at the end of the day, that's the difference of interest being $700,000 and $100,000. That's $600,000 of difference in money that we will earn that we aren't paying to the bank and get to keep. That's a lot of money. The interest rate matters and the timeline matters. There's some really great calculators out there on the internet that can visualize this for you. It's really important. So even when I said previously, I had a 13% rate on a car loan. That meant that my at the end of the day, my car that was know, 13 grand when I bought it, which I don't know if that was the greatest decision to begin with. I was in college. You probably don't need a 13 grand car. But at the end of the day, when the loan was finally said and done, the amount paid back was significantly more than that. I think it was 19 or 20. That was not a 19 or $20,000 car in value. Guarantee you, it wasn't. But that interest rate, it's so important. It's so important to understand the amortization of a loan and what you're going to be out the door at at the end of the day and to not ignore that because it's hidden under time. That's still money you're earning and money you're giving away. You got to keep that in mind. Yeah, I feel like that is the, that is how the finance, how that area of the financial industry makes so much money yeah. because you're just like oh okay what payment do you want to make right and then we'll just go okay so we won't make it 48 months we'll make it 60 or we'll make it yep. 72 yes and then if yes. you do that with everyone everyone that ever gets a loan you just add you know 24 more months you're getting more money <laughs> as the yeah. as the bank you know and that's and you think about it, it's like yeah you know that lowered my payment it's great uh, but you don't mm -hmm. have any, you're not in your, in your, in your mind, or I will, I will say many people I know will be like, oh yeah, I'll just pay it off early, but they don't have the plan to pay it off early. And then yeah. you just end up making those monthly payments. And then 72 months later, you paid twice as much for your vehicle. Like yeah. what? But I yeah, like the way you broke that down for sure. If you, if you walk into, well, certainly if you walk into any car dealership, and PSA, please don't do financing through car dealerships directly. Just general PSA, go to a private bank. It is the single best thing you could do if you're going to try to get into a car loan, which I don't recommend in the first place, but hear me out. if you Don't go through the dealership. But if you walk into a dealership or you even walk into a bank for a mortgage or a car loan or any sort of moderate to large size uh, account these days, the first question they ask you is, well, what do you want the monthly payment to be? Because that gives them the authority to change the interest rate and the length of the loan to whatever they see fit to maximize their profit while keeping your monthly rate, uh, monthly payment low. It's a, it's a recipe for disaster for you as the consumer. I totally agree with you. And we're, we're headed in a world toward everything being accounted for as the monthly rate rather than the actual sale price. Well, how do you pay for an iPhone? Well, it's $30 a month. Well, that's not how much an iPhone costs. So how much is the actual phone? And we have services like Affirm and Klarna that are amortizing $100 purchases online. Well, you could do it in four months for $25 a month. Okay, well, how much is the interest on that? Because sure, it's zero in some cases, but you're just giving yourself authority to be in a bad situation later when something comes up and now you can't make that payment. It's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a wild time we're living in. I'll leave it there.
it, it really is. You got me thinking about the cell phones as well. When my wife and I switched our plans from T-Mobile to Verizon, I was surprised to learn, you know, they, they want to give you in air quotations for people who are just listening and not watching on YouTube. You know, they want to give you the phone for free, but that's mm -hmm. over the course of, you know, a couple of years. Yeah. And it really limits your options. You know, I, I had the money to pay for new phones outright, but they're like, well, why would you do that? Because we're just going to give it to you for free. You just have to sign this contract. Right. <laughs> you know I mean? and then you, you feel stuck. You know, I, I'm technically not paying for the phone, but I'm paying in options or the lack of options. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you notice sometime in the late 2000s, maybe the early 2000 teens, where phone companies went from a proper two year service contract to no longer having service contracts, but amortizing the hardware. So you're still locked in, but they can make their marketing sound better. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know we're on a tangent, but uh, I tell you, iPhones, uh, they reveal a lot and they're expensive. So it's a good yeah. topic. Yeah. Um... Wow. Yeah, we just tangented, but that's fine. That's what we do here. Um, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, kind of talk through your... So you gave us a little bit about your start and how mm -hmm. you know it, it's important to you and how you had that light bulb moment. Um, maybe give a couple resources that you used in that time. Sure. And then we can move to kind of how you how you brought that into your marriage. Yeah, it's been an interesting journey for me. I started, I started with Dave Ramsey as my book and resource pretty heavily. That's where I started all of my learning. And I don't, I don't agree wholesale with everything hundred percent that the Ramsey collective teaches, but I agree with most of it. And I say that because when I started going through all that and learning that, at somewhere along the way, I got teased by the other half of the personal finance world that's all about arbitrage and interest rate munging and comparing and contrasting investment versus debt collection and playing your interest rates and yada, yada, yada. And there are people that can do that successfully. There are people that can play their debts and assets and interest rates versus interest rates with investment and and all that stuff, I'm alluding to a big world that I'm, I'm just not gonna go that deep into. But in the reality of it, I, I did that for a couple of years and it wasn't for me. So I, knowing that that exists and having played that game, and frankly, having not played it very well, I went back to, you know what? I'm not gonna try to play the game. I'm not gonna try to maximize the numbers with the interest rates. I'm not gonna try and compare investment values versus debt values and then equal out my net worth at the end of the day to see if I'm making money. Like I'm not doing all these things because I would rather just not have any debt and I would rather just own things because that's going to feel a lot better. It's going to feel much more secure. I understand that if you have a 3% loan for hundred grand and you also have hundred grand in an IRA that's growing at market rate, depending on what that is, you might come out ahead at the end of the day. But I also understand that that means you have $100,000 in a loan for that entire lifetime of that process you're doing this thing. And I can tell you $100,000 in a loan doesn't feel very good. It feels a whole lot better to not have any loans. And that's just worth more to me. So I, I have been on the Ramsey team for a while. Um, there's a couple other authors that you can read up on for the arbitrage and interest rate stuff. but realistically, like so often, even now being married and, and making decisions together and walking out those choices, we very often come back to what's the reasonable choice? What's the, what's the anti-debt choice? How can we maximize ownership in things and not take on loans for anything? And so I'll, I'll shorthand that as what would Dave do? But I think in reality, Dave is a Dave Ramsey is a interesting character 
and definitely a character. He's playing a role, but I think what he maximizes is common sense and let's do this the old school way. We don't need to try and be fancy and beat the system. We don't need to try to be the one person that happens to make interest rates work for them and investments and debts. Let's do this the old school way. How'd your grandparents do it? They probably saved up a ton of money, didn't buy a house until much later than you think and spent a long time trying to pay it off. They didn't even have 30 year loans back in the day. Like it's a very different world than we're living in now. And in reality, to me, that world strikes me as much more reasonable than the one we're in. Fix your stuff. Don't pay for new stuff. You know, pay off things that you owe. Uh, work hard toward being debt-free and being able to pass things down to your kid. Just very reasonable, old-school mentality that speaks to me a lot. So I continue to use that as a resource and stay sort of directed um, their content now because Ramsey Network is also a content production studio as of recently, apparently. It's hilarious. I, I recommend giving it a watch, if nothing else, because they're firecrackers and funny, but that's a big resource for us. I definitely uh, listen to them quite a bit. Me and my wife, Paul introduced me and then, you know, I in turn introduced my wife. And uh, I would agree with you that I agree with most of what they they preach. Yeah. There are a couple things where I'm just like, eh, you know, I, I can see the reasoning behind it. Yeah. The the interest rate thing, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because you know that in theory it makes sense. It's simply just not for the average person, right? It, this isn't something that you're just gonna go off and do by yourself. For the most part, you're probably going to have to have someone execute that plan for you if you're, you know, an average person. And something that isn't typically talked about is fees cutting into that interest oh, sure. rate, right? Yeah. And then what Dave Ramsey often talks about is just that risk factor, right? Which is why he calls his program financial peace. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I, uh, you know, the way it works, in a real shorthand is if I have a 3% loan, call it a hundred grand. And I also, and I have the capacity to put an extra thousand dollars a month toward that loan. Well, if instead I take that extra thousand dollars a month and put it in an IRA that maybe on average is about 7%, which I guess is what people reckon, you know, call the market on average. Well then over the course of 10 years, I'll have actually made more money because that that IRA investment will amortize higher in value than overpaying the loan and paying it off at 3%. Yeah, the reality of that is every single month, you have to choose to not spend that thousand dollars on other stuff and actually put it in the IRA. And I'm gonna tell you, that's hard. Don't recommend that. That's a hard choice to be making because using that extra thousand dollars for other stuff, since you've already decided it's not going towards overpaying the loan, that's a choice you don't want to be making every month because it's really hard to stay 100% on it. And the moment you miss one month, guess what was a better choice in the beginning? Paying off the loan early. Yeah. That's that's 120 months for those out there <laughs> trying to do the math. So 120 decisions you have to, to make correctly with a month's time in between them, right? Yeah. That's yep. a lot of opportunity for Murphy's Law to creep in. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think if you just, if we just as the average person starts thinking in terms of that, right? You say 10 years, you're like, oh, that's 10 years. But when you say 120 times, yeah, that becomes a lot more like tangible for me. And then have, and then saying, oh, you have to make the choice not to spend that $1,000 120 times, or it's not really worth it because it isn't. Right. Like if you say five, five times you don't like there's, if, but if you could have that loan paid off, then you just have the money. <laughs> like you have to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And it's, it's, you can't make 900. You have to do the thousand. That's where it creeps in because it's not like, oh, I have a thousand bucks. I can go spend it. No, it's well, 
my breaks need to be done. So maybe this month I'll just do 900 instead of a thousand in that IRA. Well, you've, you've kind of just spoiled the process, right? And, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not 50 bucks extra. Let me cut it out of the thousand and now I'm down 50 bucks um, because, because I want something or something happened. Maybe you went to the hospital. Maybe something came up in your life where you can't make a payment at all or an over amount to your IRA, right? That, that thousand dollars of discretionary now is totally used. You think about if this was five years into the loan, well, one, no longer is your, your IRA plan going to outrun your loan amount. So whether or not you come out over or not, that, you know, run the numbers, I don't know. But two, if you had just gone toward the loan, five years in, it'd probably already be gone. And now you wouldn't have to worry about that hospital bill at all and whether or not it's going to help your arbitrage continue to run successfully because it would already be gone and you would just have that money, hopefully in a savings account. So I get the game. I, I've, I've tried the game. I played it a little bit. I decided I didn't like it. And I feel a whole lot better about proper ownership than the risk, weight, and feelings of the interest rate game. It's, it's a hard, hard, hard game to play, and you have to play it perfectly. And I just, I'm not going to try and set myself up for that system. Yeah. And so there's a couple things that came to mind. Um, and, and I think we're kind of getting there. I want, I would like you to talk about the importance of a budget and also the importance of discipline, right? Because we were talking about having a hundred thousand dollar loan, right? Putting in that effort or that extra money to pay it off early. But I think there's also a discipline to not just replacing that payment with another purchase. Yeah. Right. Or, or the discipline to just stick to your budget to execute a plan. Um, so like how, how have those things worked for you? Or, you know, if you just wanted to talk about um, how you and your wife operate within a budget. Yeah. A budget is paramount. And I think that's the first thing you learn anytime someone learns about personal finances at all. Well, if you don't have a budget, start on ground zero, make a budget. You got to start there. And even though it's the first thing you do, Throughout the life of your financial career, it's probably the most important thing you do. Continue to iterate on, create, follow, and stay true with your budget. I look at ours so many times a month. I don't know if it's daily, but it's pretty close. You got you to gotta stay on it, and you have to stay disciplined to it. One thing that I think has helped us is as you grow financially, there's a point when you have to stop doling out the pie until it's empty and start budgeting based on what's reasonable because ideally your pie grows over the years. And just because your pie is growing doesn't mean you should spend $2,000 a month at the grocery store. That's not reasonable for most people. I don't, everyone's their own circumstance. Everything I'm saying here has an asterisk legally. All right, folks, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but that's not reasonable. So don't just dole out the pie Budget based on what's reasonable if you can. If you can't, do you have to make hard choices? And for many people, it's yes, you have to make hard choices. You have to choose to not put as much money into this one thing so that you can continue to carve out this stuff. I don't want to repeat everything in, in the lexicon of personal finance knowledge, but for us, it's what's actually reasonable for two people in a month as far as eating out is a big one for us. And as it comes to discipline, we found that hard. I mean, we, we put aside a good chunk of money for like eating out every month and be that with friends or just the two of us or what have you. We've gone over on that plenty of times. And I think for us, it's, well, I think we need to switch to cash now because I don't care how cool plastic is and I don't want to hear anyone talk about the rewards. I get it. I have them. It's fine, whatever, but it doesn't feel the same as cash and it doesn't hit you the same as cash and you don't track numbers the same as when it's in your pocket. So when we're doing not great on a particular line item for a couple months, my first take is, well, we're switching the cash thing because that'll keep us honest. And so let's withdraw that at the beginning of the month and that's all we have and if it runs out it runs out we did that and that way it's it's a little more black and white 
you can't just throw a card at it and then think about it later and regret it later. The budget ideally should be something that's set ahead of time as a dictate and not tracked after time. If your budget turns into importing all your transactions afterwards and just tracking them, it's not a budget, it's just a tracker. So setting a budget and the discipline to follow it and the discipline to convert to a more painful mechanism of spending if you're not following it well is sort of my continuum of let's stay on track. And it works, I promise you, if you if you switch to cash on a particular line item, it works. You will feel it tremendously different. I guarantee you, it works. I agree. It, <laughs> it does. Um, so I know we talked about it a little bit, but I mean, you had, you know, your paradigm shift as a sophomore in college and started going on that. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how that played into, you know, once you found the woman of your dreams, you decide you're going to get married. All right. We have to talk about everything. We're now talking about finance. Like, how did that work out for you all as a couple? Yeah, I, I find it really interesting. When we got married and, and actually before we got married, as we knew that that was coming, I don't know if it was my parents influence on me maybe, or possibly even just having already learned a lot of the Ramsey collective ethos and a lot of personal finance knowledge from various authors. But for me, it was actually quite easy to open up all the books. Let's talk about everything. Here's all the numbers. Here's all the transactions. Here's your access. We, we can go through whatever you want to see open book here. I, I don't know exactly where that came from, but in my head, it's like, you know, we're married. This is our money now. And I think that that's, it, it was a transition that came naturally to me, but I don't know if it's always supernatural, not supernatural, super natural. But when we came together in finances, I think in reality, as much as I enjoy the logistics and knowledge and, and execution of personal finances, I tend to actually be a little bit more of the, the bougie person and maybe the spender. And Kalika definitely is more of the saver and how much can we can we push ourselves to stay true to things. Not that I'm not always true to a budget, but I'm not always true to a budget. I'm not perfect. So when we were headed toward marriage and we really opened up the books and started talking through everything, well, first of all, it's, this is us now. This isn't me. I don't have a place to feel offended here. It's just numbers. There's no, let's, let's just make it numbers. I'm not emotionally tied to them, but now we're together. This is us. One thing that's been really important for me throughout our marriage and time is that it's our money. I don't consider it my money. I don't consider it your money. It's our money. I don't care who makes it. I don't care where it comes from. We have one account. We're both on it. It's ours. And that's really important to me as it comes to being aligned and on a financial plan together and, and working through these things together. It's not my money. It's not her money. It's our money. And even if even if where it comes from is, is one way or the other, it's ours. And she has just as much ownership over it as I do. And I have just as much ownership over it as she does. I think that's a really important characteristic that, I don't know, I, I know a lot of couples that, that don't necessarily do that. And I don't want to, I, I don't want to, you know, it's not my place to judge them or anything. But for me, I couldn't fathom that because it can introduce so many questions of ownership and desire and budgeting and, well, should we have separate budgets and all this stuff. And for me, that's not, our marriage is supposed to be the conjunction of our lives together. And if that's not financial, then that's a huge piece that's not there. So the, the R, the joint ownership is a big piece of that. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay. 
and you know, just to put a different perspective on it that you may not have seen, but that I've personally walked through, that was difficult for me. You know, we in my marriage we're there now, mm-hmm. but we didn't start that way. And you know, I had a more than likely different upbringing than you, mm-hmm. uh, where you know it was like robbing Peter to pay Paul. Didn't have mm-hmm. enough money coming in for the amount of expenses we had going out. Gotcha. You know, and that world was largely hidden from me, I would say. Mm. Right. I, what I knew is more times than not, if I asked for something, I would have it. I didn't always know how that was made available to me, though. Mm. Right. So there's some poor decisions that were made financially within my family. Sure. And then when I got older, I learned oh, I know how to make money. This is great. So I'll just spend whatever I want and then I'll make more. Didn't learn about saving, right? I, it was like Dave Ramsey says, I was just trying to out earn my stupid, but I didn't understand that I was being <laughs> stupid. Sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And um, now introduce a relationship to that equation. I'm still just trying to out earn my stupid. And I knew that, all right, we need X amount of dollars for this, I'll say part of the relationship to work. Okay. It's, you know, sort of a budget in your head. I'll set that money aside for the relationship, but I'm still going to do me over here. Mm. So how can I increase my income? All right, I'll go do this, this, and this. And I'll just enjoy my stupid and my little piece of sanity over here, right? Not knowing that if we were to get on the same page, that I could have all the things that I want, I might have to pay a little bit in patience and diligence and discipline and all these things. But in the grand scheme of things and long term, I'll have all the things that I want. Oh, by the way, I'll also be able to keep my wife happy. I'll also be able to keep my children happy, right? And just have a much more peaceful household because there aren't those, I want to say secrets or, you know, uncomfortable spaces in finance that we just weren't talking about, right? How much Mm -hmm. money do you actually have? Yeah. Like, well, well, none, because I spent it all, (laughs) right? Or- Maybe I had a pot of money over here that I was planning on using for something, but we could have been putting it towards, you know, the purchase of a house or paying off debt. And, you know, so all that to say, we're in a much more financially peaceful area now that we've tackled our debt and are now saving to, to purchase a home, which I'm really grateful for having this conversation with you because, you know, we're looking to tackle that in the next couple of years. Yeah. Good information. Yeah, it's. Uh, I was talking to Kalika about it the other day, and to my surprise, she said, "Well, we just we communicate a ton, and maybe it's just that as men, we're often not attributed as, wow, you guys are amazing communicators." But I was like, "Oh, we do. We communicate a lot." But she started talking about it a little bit deeper, and I think it's totally true. And I don't always recognize it in myself because I, I sort of just do it. I'm not really sure, but. We talk about everything, the short-term plan financially, the long-term plan financially, what we're after, what our goals are. If we even want to make a purchase up to a certain point, we, we talk about it. Hey, babe, I want to spend 50 bucks on this thing. What do you think? And then we have an open table to figure out if that's worthwhile, if it's in our budget, if it's not, if it should be justified, why you're doing that, what it's for. And then we sort of decide if we want to go ahead with that. And that's challenging sometimes for sure. I mean, we all have those moments where you really want a thing and it's really hot in your brain right now and you could totally go buy that thing. And I have those very often, but in reality, those things don't help us toward our financial goals, short or long-term. And even though it's hard to take the pill of it's not the right time right now, sometimes you have to be honest with yourself and say, it's not the right time right now. And if you're not talking about those things and communicating about them as a couple, 
you're also not going to be headed towards your goals the way you want to as a couple. Money is not complicated as it is emotionally hard. Numbers add up to numbers. They're not, there's, there's no subjective answer. It's all objectively just numbers and you get to choose how they roll. But having a spouse, not, not to keep you honest because you're a team, but having a spouse to keep you on your team when maybe something cool happens or you want to get something or that new thing just came out is the most important part of your long-term plan to me. You have to stay on the same team. And if you're not talking about everything and you're not open about everything, I personally don't know how that would work. You got to be on the same team about all of it. You are on the same team. You're married. You're a couple. So there's just a lot of talking about stuff where we've iterated on like, well, what can I just go buy? And it's a pretty small number. I think if I order something on Amazon for like less than $25, it's probably fine to just do that. But that still is a budget line that we have. We have like little purchase items, things we want to get. But I, I'm not ever doing anything that's like even $100. You know, we talk about it because that's money and it's not nothing. And it's important to make sure that we agree on this stuff. So I, I agree with you there. That's good. I think what you just said is keep having, being on the same team allows you to communicate about your goals short term and long term. And if you're doing that continually, the smaller one offs are less likely to happen, like the smaller deviations. Right. If, because if you're like, all right, we're still working towards this and yeah. Oh, but I want to get this. Okay. Does that still work? Can we still get to where we want to go in the same time frame? Will that slow it down? How we'll do, is it worth it? Right. If yeah. you're having those conversations continually, that definitely makes you see the, how those everyday purchases don't really matter as much as the long as the sh either in the short term and the long term goal and yeah. that can make you be like oh yeah i don't really need that because we want to get to this place so that's pretty good that's real good actually yeah and and you know that's on the back side of actually using the money i think it's super important to be communicative to a super high degree on the front side of actually budgeting at the beginning of that cycle too we've had so many good growth points in budgeting because we talk about it a lot. I have for the first year of our marriage continued to think that budgeting $300 for two people for a month of groceries was like, why can't we do this? This seems like we could do this thing. And it's through the continued communication and iteration of our budget over that time that Kalika finally was like, John, two people for a month of groceries is not going to be $300. We haven't done it. It's not going to happen. Let's be realistic and grow in our budget and change this to something more pragmatic so that we're not going over it every month. Because the, the thing you don't want is every month to go over on something. Either you need more discipline in it or you're incorrectly budgeting at the beginning of the month. And for us, it was the latter. And so the communication and continued working on it at the beginning of the cycle, when you're actually writing your budget and figuring out how much you want to spend in those line items is also so important. So I guess it's true on both sides, the whole way through the, the gamut, you got to be talking about stuff all the time and you got to be open and transparent and here's all of our money. Here's where it sits. Here's what we're using it for. Here's what we're headed toward. And here's the budget we're going to use this month to help us along our, our goals. So was that easy for you guys from jump just to talk about it? I know you said for you, it was easy, but like, was she on board with talking and, you know, just like putting it all out there? Let's have these budget conversations and just talk about it. As I, I know in my coaching, like it's, it's not always that easy. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, you're good to just have one person that wants to do it, much yeah. less both. If you have both, that's amazing. And you, we work to get people to that space. Um, but most of the time, it's it's hard for those of us that 
didn't grow up with that being a conversation that they saw modeled, you now just bring whatever you think it should be, and then you have to work through it. So how was that for you? I mean, if it worked for both of you, that's great. I just, I'm just curious because I know you were very open about how that worked and your mindset, but did Kalika kind of come on board with that or was that something you guys had to work with? I know she likes to communicate, so. <laughs> True. Yeah, it's funny because I don't, I don't readily associate that as being modeled in my upbringing very much. And I can't say if my parents talked a lot more not in front of the kids, because obviously I was one of the kids, but at least in front of the kids, I didn't have a whole lot of financial conversations modeled. So again, I'm not entirely sure where it comes from in me, but uh, I think we both came very open to the table and that was really cool. We were both really ready and willing to talk about this stuff and we weren't afraid to approach it and we didn't have any uh, reservations with getting into the, the realities of numbers and goals and things. I mean, we both had very aligned mindsets and I was sort of coming out of the arbitrage interest rates continuum. When Kalika and I first got together, I was recently decided this isn't going to work. I want to do the ownership, real actual ownership money program. And Kalika had already been on that continuum. So our goals aligned really quickly. We want to, we want to actually have wealth and own things and pay things off and not be in debt. So that was, that was really easy to line up, which was great. And to come in with goals aligned is a great thing to also come in being willing to be transparent on numbers and finances and where the state of things is, is also great. I mean, I'll be honest, when we got together, I had a pretty big personal loan from uh, coming out of credit card world and student loans as well. Like I brought to the relationship, some skeletons in the closet, but I wasn't afraid to talk about those because I knew that we would get through them. And I know that's hard and it, it, it didn't feel the best at the time, but it feels really good now knowing that we did talk about them and we did decide to get through them and we got through them. And that's a that was worth it for sure. So worth it. What's been growth for us as a couple has been more so what we choose to spend money on and how much we choose to spend money on. We were a, we, we have different mindsets around that. And I alluded to that earlier with the sort of the, the bougie spender and me versus a little bit more of the conservative approach that Kalika brings. And that has been our sort of melding point between the two of us and where we kind of find a middle ground, which is super healthy. And we're really happy with that. But we were one of those couples that sort of was fine coming to the table with open checkbooks, if you will. Nice. Um, there was one thing I wanted to circle back to. And that is, do you believe in having sort of like fun money as a part of your budget um, and specifically separate fun money? Does that make sense? Oh, sure. Like, like just my fun money. Right, right. Where you don't have to explain, hey, I'm going to spend X amount of dollars on this. Like it's in the budget because it's there. We've discussed that, you know, I can use this money for whatever I feel that I can just go ahead and do what I want or save that money across a couple months to make a, a larger fun money purchase. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, if I have a generalized belief on that. On one hand, at the end of the day, numbers are going to add up to numbers. And if you take some out for fun money, you can't change the math. If you have a long-term goal, the numbers are going to add up the way that you spend them. So if you're pulling stuff out for fun money, that's going to impact your long-term goals. That is what it is. And regardless of whether or not that's just for you or something you guys still talk about, it's a factor, right? Like you can't, you can't make magic out of numbers. They're just numbers. Um, we don't do that personally. We, we do budget sort of fun activities money every month. Um, we have it broken down a bit. So we, we budget like eating out money separately from activities money which i would think of as like going out to top golf or going to see a movie and we budget that separately from um what i call small purchase items which are you know little things you find on amazon you want to order little pieces of stuff but 
but all of that is in our budget and we do talk about those things together and i think where it could be an issue is if you don't have the sort of foundation in your in your communication and compassion if i want to get something just because i'm excited by it and i think it's fun and i really want it kalika is totally ready to say hey you should get that because it excites you and you're excited about it and it's fun the sort of fun purchase that you would make with the quote unquote fun money i would think that a husband and wife should be able to feel the excitement for one another independently to support that purchase in talking about it like if you're using the not talking about it as the mechanism for being able to accomplish something that strikes me as well shouldn't you be able to be able to accomplish that same thing while talking about it because that person will be excited for you and i think that that's the approach that we like to foster and you know if kalika wants to go buy some stuff or a thing which is rare it's more often me than it is her but I want to support her in that. And oftentimes I'll buy her something because I want to support her in that because she she sometimes doesn't feel like she wants to pull the trigger on it. And to me, I want to pull the trigger for her. I want to get her <laughs> yeah, the cool do. thing. Yeah, you do. <laughs> but uh, I believe in fun money. I think that I think that it's important to budget. I still think it's important to talk about. I don't think it should, for, for us, it's not a separate account. It's not outside of the scope of the budget. It's not hidden anywhere. But at the same time, uh, I know the Ramsey continuum is rice and beans, beans and rice, eat nothing, work grind all day. And he's not wrong in the sense that the numbers aren't magic, right? Like right. you can't make magic happen with numbers. They're just numbers. So if you do go that route, yes, you're going to maximize the debt paying off in, in that continuum. But I understand both sides of it. I, I just do think it should still be budgeted and talked about. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think it's not about hiding the things that you might want to purchase. I, I'm all about having those conversations. And especially if it's a larger purchase where, you know, I have a line item for personal fund money and I know it's going to take me, you know, five, six months to get to that number that I want to spend. We're having yeah. a conversation about it. But sure. more or less what I'm talking about is like the the spontaneity of it, right? If I know I have X amount of dollars in my personal fund money and I'm out golfing with buddies and they're, you know, saying, Hey, we want to, you know, have a, have a meal after our round. I'm probably not going to necessarily ask my wife to spend that money. If I have it in my own fund money, you know, well, I'll have yeah. a conversation that, Hey, I'm going to be later than I, you expected. Yeah, sure. But, um, the decision on whether I could, partake of a meal with my friends or not is going to be based on whether I have that, that fun money there. Yeah. So. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, we have a, we have a line item specifically for like when we're eating out, but it's not with us together. And so like, if I was to go eat out with friends, it would come out of that. And we don't worry about that too much. I think that if that kind of thing, sure, we, you know, it's in the line item, it's fine. But at the same time, especially for me personally, spontaneity is a dangerous thing. And so often I've found myself in that spontaneous phase, maybe ignoring the budget a little bit. And so I think it's a, it, there's a balance, right? Like I want to be spontaneous and go hang out with people and, and do the stuff that you know, you're describing just as much as, as everyone else. But sometimes you can't be spontaneous and go hang out with your friends if you're already over your line item on that thing. And that's a hard pill to swallow. I don't like talking about that. I don't like that conversation. But it's real. You can't make magic out of numbers. They all add up. So it, it, there's, a, there's a balance somewhere in the middle of like, yeah, I want to have that, that money budgeted so that I can go do those things. But I can't go do those things every three days all month long. Like there's a limit to which as much as I want to be spontaneous and fun and hang out with friends, like no matter how much you make, you have to be willing to say it's not in the budget right now because the more that that income grows over the years and the budget feels, you know, you can get into the phase where the budget feels more like a recommendation because maybe you have a little bit extra happening somewhere and you know that you can pull from it. And when you get into that phase, it gets really slippery. So that, that spontane, uh, spontaneity, 
for me personally, knowing how I handle spontaneity, you got to be careful. Is there a world where your home is now paid off, where you find yourself, I guess, with the ability to relax a little bit? Or personally for you, do you just find yourself replacing that with a new financial goal? Right? Like, I feel for us, we, we decided on a number each month to put away for a down payment. Yeah. We could definitely be more strict about it and put more away, but we like having that little bit of flexibility as well for, you know, our, our spontaneity. Well, yeah. um, so, you know, do you, do you find yourself thinking to the future that, you know, we, there is a point where we might be able to relax a little bit, or do you have your budget so fine tuned that you don't necessarily feel a need for that because you have, you know, your, your fun and eating out and all those things are already planned. Um, I think there is, there is that world. And even right now with the house and even, even in this phase of, I want to pay this thing off. I want to pay this thing off fast. I don't want to do this for a long time. Even in that, that was still all predicated with, well, before I even look at a house, before I even think about all this stuff, let me see what a normal month would look like where we have space to do stuff and have fun and not feel like we're saying no to everything. Let me get that normal budget, whatever that normal quote unquote means that has a little bit of breathing room to where we're not blowing tons of money, but we're also not incapable of being present with people. And then based on that normal budget, let me see what I can run numbers on and what we can, you know, what our, our mortgage looks like and all those other things. So now that we're on the other side of it, we're, we're on a plan to be paying off the mortgage significantly faster, but still didn't encroach on that normal budget. So even right now we have space to relax. I don't feel particularly financially pressured on a month to month basis with our current budget, just knowing how we tend to spend and what we tend to do. It's not completely pressureless. There are certainly times when I can't go buy that new thing or we can't go get that brand new blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that's fine. Uh, but in reality, that ends up being fine. Now in the future, yeah, there's totally space to, to use money. Money is a tool. And once you get to a certain point where you're happy with it and you want to use it differently, use it differently. It's your choice. I think that especially when we get to the point of, okay, the house is paid off and we have a couple kids and we want to cherish that and shower them with cool things. Like I want to do that. And yeah, you should probably put some away all the time. I don't ever want to have months where I'm using all of the money, but that number can change in its proportion significantly. And you should be able to use that tool for exciting things. You should be able to use that tool for the glory of the kingdom and give a lot of it away and be, uh, generous and shower the people that you love with, with the tools and things that will help them. Right. Like it's not a save all the time forever. That's not what it's about. It's just in this case, when it talk, when, when we're talking about a house, don't constrain yourself so hard that you can't sustain this for a long time, but you're not now at the place of, rolling around in dough because you have a giant mortgage on your back and you maybe you're choosing to ignore it, but it's still there. Once you get beyond that, sure, roll around in the dough. It's your dough. Do what you want. Nice. I got some money to go spend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that goes that goes back to, you know, what you're saying at the beginning. Like you don't really own it. You're just agreeing to pay someone for it. So but once yeah. you own it, own it, then all that money that you were spending you had committed to pay now is yours like you're not committing yeah. to, to give it to a bank you're now it's now just sitting waiting for you, basically waiting to for you to decide what to do and obviously yeah. if you get your your budget together then you can have decided what you're going to do before it's sitting there but yeah that's awesome yeah i think i mean there's a balance and i think that that's where Kalika and i really find good progression forward. I help her 
see and understand and be willing to use money. It's there to be used. It's there to do things with responsibly, but it's a tool to be used and it's okay to use it sometimes. And she helps me understand that it's a tool that's not always to be used. Sometimes you need to be careful with it. And we don't fit into the canonical paradigm of spender and saver because we both are more dynamic than that. So I'm not going to say that that's the simplicity of it. It's not. But we have different proclivities towards money and we help each other stay on plan while still being relaxed a little bit in a way that helps us move forward really healthily. I love it. Man, I, I, I know we need to wrap up, um, but I just wanted to take a little time to thank you for this conversation. You know, I, even though I knew a lot of the information you shared, I've also learned a little bit. It was nice learning about you. Nice meeting you. So, yeah. you know, thank you. It was, like I said, we are just, well, I, we're about halfway through this journey. First half of it was paying off our debt. Second half is, you know, really getting on board with each other and putting money away. I mean, really a significant down payment for a home. Yeah. We don't want to be in that area where, like you said, we have this big gorilla of a bank on our back and, you know, we're, we're just fighting to stay afloat because we committed to this huge house payment. Yeah. So, just once again. Yeah, thanks. of course. I'm glad you went in that order. Uh, a lot of people don't. And uh, that's a different situation. So I, we went in the same order. I think that that's the healthy order to go in. Um, I'm glad to be here. I love the topic and I have a big heart for it. It's a, it's a hard one to figure out how to talk to people about um, directly, obviously like in a podcast, right? You're, you're kind of creating this thing that people can opt in to listen to, but it's hard when you have such a heart for it and you want to you know, talk to your friends and family about it. And it's like, well, maybe, maybe not. So <laughs> it's a, uh, it's so pivotal. It's so important. And it's such a critical factor to peace specifically in marriage, um, that it, it can't be overstated. And it, it's so good to talk about and take reps on. You might know all the content. I don't listen to the Ramsey's content on YouTube because I'm going to have some wild revelation of new stuff. I listen to it because it helps me take reps on what the reality of money is and keep myself pretty based on yeah i'm not making bad choices right now and yeah you're right i need i need to hear that i need that rep i need that reminder I should probably just not buy this thing or buy a used version of it or buy a cheaper version of it or like the base model is probably going to satisfy all my needs i don't need all the bells and whistles like that kind of stuff they're just good reps to take always absolutely um yeah so uh let's wrap it up all right. Hey, I want to do. I want to take this opportunity to just remind the listeners that you can connect with us on our social medias. That's Marriage is Tougher. Searching, um, well, search Marriage is Tougher. Sorry, through the social medias, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We're in all those places. If you want to continue the conversation with us over there, please do so. If you have any questions for us and aren't interested in being on the show, you can post the questions there. Or if you have any. Uh, topics you'd like us to talk about and bring up in the future, please do that there. Other than that, we want to thank John for being on the show. And uh, beyond that, we will talk to you all next time. See ya. See ya. <laughs>